Welcome to the STS Roundtable on Diversity in Cardiothoracic Surgery. My name is David Cook and I'm from uh, UC Davis. And today we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion are important topics to the STS. It is the vision of our STS president, Dr. Richard Prager, to develop the STS Task Force on Diversity and Inclusion. This year, in 2018, at the STS annual meeting, we have our inaugural panel session dedicated to diversity and inclusion, entitled Diversity and Inclusion, what is it, What's in It for Me? Today, we're going to have a wonderful discussion about diversity uh, in our cardiothoracic surgical uh, communities uh, and our workforce and the STS organization. Uh, today, we have uh, uh, individuals uh, who represent uh, different viewpoints from stakeholders within the cardiothoracic surgical community. We're going to go around the table and introduce ourselves. Hi, uh, my name is Luis Godoy. I'm a uh, PGY4 uh, in the integrated program at uh, UC Davis in Sacramento. I'm Africa Wallace. I'm a thoracic surgeon at Piedmont Heart Institute in Atlanta. It's a multi-specialty group that's part of a community-based health system. And I'm Jackie Olive. I'm a first-year medical student at Baylor College of Medicine. And as, uh, as I stated earlier, my name is David Cook. I'm a thoracic surgeon at UC Davis in Sacramento. So let's get right into it. So Jackie, how do we define diversity and inclusion? I think it's very valuable to differentiate between diversity and inclusion, first of all, because when I think of diversity, I think of generally what we see and then inclusion of having that foot in the door and the place on the table to make an impact. And generally, I think everybody thinks of diversity in an individual perspective, you know, based on where they are, where they're practicing, what status they are in their career. Um, but I do think, you know, it, it includes a lot of different categories ranging from race, ethnicity, gender, um, socioeconomic background, et cetera, um, and your background, your interests. Um, and inclusion, I think, goes beyond that and takes a step into how those factors can really play a role in the practice and the evolution of the practice moving forward. So Africa, why, why is diversity important? So it's important uh, to be able to develop a culturally competent workforce. Um, as we talk about uh, diversity, you know, as Jackie said, it's a lot of different, it's, it's what makes us individuals, you know, and it's more than just race and ethnicity. Um, it's gender, age, um, physical disabilities. It's a host of things that make, that make us individuals. Inclusion is when uh, we establish a workplace that celebrates these differences instead of just tolerating them and it uh, provides an atmosphere where there's equality. So, Luis, what are the, some of the myths we may harbor about diversity? So, one of the uh, most common uh, misconceptions that I've uh, come across when the discussion of diversity and inclusion has been brought up either in medical school and residency or uh, you know, in other places is, um, there's a common misconception that uh, when the terms diversity and inclusion are brought up, uh, that those same terms are put on an equal level as a, as a quota, as you're, you're uh, making certain number, you know, you have to meet a minimum number um, uh, to meet a quota, which is completely different from what we're, we're trying to discuss and what our definition is. Um, what we're trying to define is we're trying to um, talk about diversity and inclusion and uh, um, uh, increasing those numbers of qualified individuals who are, have the high qualifications that we need uh, in, in this particular field uh, and also to help recruit people that uh, may not necessarily have a specific interest in cardiothoracic surgery. Um, um, and we're, you know, trying to find ways on how to expose these people to the field and get them interested in, in inclusion. And diversity um, does not mean uh, non-merit-based recruitment, right, Africa? Correct. Correct. Um, you know, if, if even if, let's, for argument's sake, 
uh, race played a role in who got into the medical who got into medical school or who got into uh, residency programs you still have to pass and, and and meet those metrics that allow you to practice as a doctor so um, you know you still are responsible for passing the boards and becoming a competent surgeon so you know it doesn't mean that this person gets has a different pathway and that um, and that they're less competent uh, because they, you know, race was a factor. And, and I think it's important that we actively uh, try to establish a diverse um, uh, medical school population, residency population, um, and which will translate into a more diverse and culturally competent workforce. Mm -hmm. and, and Jackie, you mentioned earlier about visibility mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of what you see. It, when, you, when you talk about diversity, you're, you're we're talking about individuals uh, who are, are high level, high achieving, and high performing, yet how do we recruit them into our specialty? Uh, how, how do we make our specialty more reflective of the communities they serve? Mm -hmm. So I think as surgeons and aspiring surgeons, we all are proactive and we want to get involved early. Um, I can, you know, as a first year medical student sitting here next to y'all, um, I, I really think that having early exposure within the formative years of medical school, even before getting into clinics, is highly valuable to attract people who otherwise wouldn't have the resources or know about CT surgery and what the field encompasses and who the kinds of people are within the field um, and who they, they would be working with. Um, they wouldn't necessarily know about that before having to make you know, the critical decision of where to go and where to train, and especially with options. Um, now where you can go straight into CT surgery, that's less of a time window if you find out, you know, your third or beginning of your fourth year that this is a field of possible interest. So establishing that resource early would be very valuable. So Africa, can you describe a time when a diverse workforce made the difference in delivering quality patient care? Sure. Um, I think that um, for example, I, I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia, um, which is the South, and it has a pretty big African-American population. And um, there are times when uh, I think uh, African-American patients um, are more comfortable uh, with me because I'm African-American. Women are more comfortable with me. Um, I think studies have shown that when there's a concordance of race and ethnicity and gender from with the provider and the patient that it increases patient satisfaction and it increases uh, their adherence to medical therapy or their compliancy. So, um, you know, this actually impacts our outcomes um, because patients are more inclined to one, seek medical care and, um, and adhere to the medical um, therapy that's been provided or recommended. You know, when you look at healthcare disparities, uh, the number one killer um, in the United States, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, minority populations and women, are heart disease mm -hmm. and lung cancer, and uh, which basically is the the lion's share of the problems uh, we face in the cardiothoracic surgical community, and we are fighting to to eliminate. Yet these disparities are very much prevalent um, within underrepresented minority populations uh, as well as women. So, um, Luis, do you feel your experience coming from being a Latino has helped you care for specific patient populations or help direct those individuals to evidence-based care? Yes, um, absolutely. It has helped tremendously, um, especially with our diverse patient population that we have in Sacramento, California. We have a large Latino community. And, uh, and I remember one, one specific case that really sticks out in my mind was a young man, he's in his mid-20s, he came in with endocarditis. He had had prior operations in the past. And uh, when I went in to do the history and physical and the pre-op uh, um, care, he, he didn't really have any idea, neither him or his family, about the prior operations he's had in the past. And um, when I sat down and explained to them, you know, from going through the records, what operations he, he'd had in the past and what operations he was going to have in the near future, uh, they were just uh, blown away. He had no idea he had open heart surgery in the past, even though he had a big sternotomy scar. Um, 
but th this is one of those things where the, the family didn't quite understand the um, treatment that they had gotten, their you know, compliance to their medication regimen and antibiotics. Um, um, they just had a poor comprehension of that just because of the cultural gap uh, uh, within the care. And, and so I was able to bridge that gap and, and um, you know, help, help him get through his operation and his post-op care and follow up in clinic. I think that, you know, me being a Latino myself and speaking to the patient and his family and his loved ones, because it's not just the patient, it's the, the family, it's a family unit that, that, uh, that we're treating. Uh, I think uh, uh, by being uh, able to bridge that gap, I was able to um, get a good outcome. So you, go ahead. If I can address what, yeah. you know, the statement you just said. I think that um, um, by increasing diversity in the workforce, um, it increases the pool of, um, of people that would, could then be um, put in leadership positions and, um, and in policy making positions. Yeah. And so, uh, for example, if women are involved in perhaps uh, the disparities in uh, gender um, in lung cancer, esophageal cancer, ischemic heart disease, uh, women, if a woman is involved in the decision making, then that women's health would be a priority for that, for that, um, for the system. And the same as with minorities, um, we would be more, you know, when people set up their research agenda, you know, that's kind of, they, they are influenced by their own biases. Mm -hmm. um, the things that they find interesting to study is based on, and, and it's unconscious, you know, it's based on your own experiences and what you feel are important. And if you have uh, diversity in a room, then there'll be a diversity of ideas about what's important and what should be priority for both research and for policy making. So uh, cultural competency, uh, the understanding of cultures and cultural dexterity, being able to use that understanding uh, in patient care yourself, even if you may not be a part of that right. uh, culture, is important not only in, in the direct patient care, but in, important for advocacy and important for research, is my understanding. Correct. Um, and, and that leads us to serving as role models uh, to get uh, to convince students and residents to come into our, our great specialty. Um, mentors. You know, Jackie, does, does a mentor have to look like you? You know, just as I think diversity is an asset in a workplace, I think it's an asset to have a diverse set of mentors who can coach you through a lot of the different aspects of training. And it's not just technical and academic. There are personal aspects to training, too, where certainly I can think of several who have been able to connect with me on that deeper level because they've looked like me and also because they haven't looked like me. So I think there's value to having a wide variety of opinions, certainly. But the key is that they, they, they value you as your potential uh, and your, your, uh, your, your current um, ability to provide care Right. Uh, and our, um, uh, feel your professional development is important. Yes. I also think that lack of diversity kind of sets the tone and culture of the specialty. Um, if when you're, when you're um, looking at medical schools or looking at residency programs or looking at special specialties, you certainly are more inclined to, if it's a male dominated specialty, think that you that culture would not be a good fit for you. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon us to um, to demonstrate that we are inclusive and, and, and encourage people and, and like I said, celebrate the differences and create an environment where uh, there will be equality and equal access. And to piggyback on that too, I think the paradigm of training and you know what my generation values is different than what I think previous generations do too. This is something that people ask about and look for specifically in training programs and I think if the STS and other professional societies and other mentors who are looking to train and advocate on behalf of people like myself who are just starting their training, I think this is something that needs to be continually addressed in the dialogue as well. So these are all wonderful points that we bring up, um, but uh, to avoid preaching to the choir, how do we take these concepts and disseminate it to stakeholders who may not know about the importance of diversity and inclusion? Very, <clears throat> very good question. And, um, um, you know, like uh, when we have these kinds of discussions, it's um, obvious that most of the people that are going to be involved in these discussions are, are uh, uh, people who are stakeholders in, in uh, the outcomes of these, these discussions. 
Um, I think one of the main ways that, that we can reach out um, to other people is just, you know, um, uh, focusing on outcomes. You have a culturally competent workforce um, um, dealing with a culturally diverse patient population. Um, and it's been proven to uh, um, show that you have positive outcomes after your operations. I think that's one key set. There's many more, but it's So at the end of the day, it's about the patient. I, I agree. Yeah. And having a diverse point of view in regards to clinical innovation and quality improvement uh, leads to better patient outcomes. Correct. So thank you very much. In conclusion, uh, the goals of diversifying the cardiothoracic surgical workforce our, our training paradigms and our STS organization uh, are all important goals of the STS. The STS Task Force on Diversity and Inclusion is here for, for you, and we want to hear from you. If you have ideas on, on what we can do better to make our uh, cardiothoracic surgical community and our organization more diverse and more inclusive, please contact us or send us a message on Twitter. Well, thank you very much. And um, uh, I hope you enjoyed our roundtable discussion.